So I'm Jonathan, I'm one of the intro founders of Cluster Marine. Uh, we build all electric outboard motors for boats. Um, it originally stemmed out of undergraduate research we did when we were in college. Uh, we did the full gamut of kind of start accelerator programs, draft writing competitions, um, everything in between. Um, since the competition back in 2020, we've got the latest couple of funding rounds. Uh, we now have just over 30 full time employees, and we just opened up the factory uh, down in Bristol. Um, so we've been uh, very fortunate to be. Located in Rhode Island, we've moved around a little bit before COVID, uh, but we've been thankful to find Rhode Island's off the home now. So it's a great place to go. Thank you both. Um, let's jump right in and start with a question. Uh, let's go to Caleb. What motivated you to apply to the competition? So, actually, one of our other co founders, Sean, um, had previously participated in the competition with her company, Chuck. And so she saw there was coming up and said, let's do it. Um, admittedly, we are coming with quite at the point where we felt uh, we were really ready to do it, but we kind of felt like it was an opportunity. And it, was just, you know, it was definitely one of those passes where you just want to help the competition. Never too early. And uh, if you're going to start on well, be a super brain player. Don, how about yourself? What motivated the folks from? Yes. So we were bootstrapping very much. Uh, so the mixture of kind of having that money. Um, but also kind of trying to get um, to the next stage of our, the business. Um, so we applied just as, well, originally uh, I'd worked with kind of another defense contractor, but then about eight days before COVID hit, we decided to quit our jobs and go full time, uh, which was probably 
about the first time, it wasn't a graduate. Uh, so we acquired a competition uh, in the hopes that it would allow us to kind of get that in the next inflection point that didn't to close the funding round, uh, which it did successfully do. And so the main motivation was more the, uh, the in kind services, but the capital also in the company. Pete, please, before I go, with that resilience, you know, I wouldn't have picked it if I did. <laughs> um, what would you have done now? I saw you come here to talk about this. Yeah, that's one thing. I would maybe, uh, I would probably quit until, actually, no, I would have quit as fast. But maybe started actually a little bit earlier. So, more probably in the actual application timeline, maybe start the application a little bit earlier just to give a few more opportunities to have a, a few more people take a look at it, give some feedback. And hopefully, give us a better chance of the problem. Yeah, how about yourself? What would your team have done differently? Yeah, I would say a similar thing. I think that if we had started the application a little bit earlier, or we had a little more time to flush out the idea before we jumped into it, because we were definitely still kind of doing best with that. So, the co founder is laughing with that. Um, and I think that that was one of the things that we were, you know, some of the feedback we had after the competition was about you know, our preparedness. And I think, you know, we, Took that into account, and I think it was, you know, some of us were like, yeah, we can totally believe that. <laughs> um, so I feel on our side, um, you know, I think that being better prepared was a good thing. Uh, you know, one of the things we've, we've done, um, we checked the website, we kind of revised the uh, program, if you will, uh, as the world evolved, we're less focused on the actual business plan, we're more focused on the actual business idea. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's still an application. You know? yeah. And let's let's stick with that because you mentioned the application. Um, so so tell us, Caitlin, how your team got started with it, how long did it take? So this was actually um, because Saran has some experience, she was able to jump into it pretty quick. But we were actually just laughing because there's some things on the application that we got filled out wrong and we were going, where did that thing go? What happened to that? Um, so it was done in kind of record time. Two and a half days on it, or three days, three. But we also were made aware of the competition very close to the deadline. Had we been more prepared, we jumped into it and we were like, okay, let's get it done, let's get it done. And so we had like some one person on the West Coast, we had one person on the West, we were in all different time zones, like all trying to get it and go after it. So I would say probably a two days. So I'd like to introduce my co chair, um, Peggy Farrell, who is an attorney at UK Island. Peggy's a judge, so. You know, when, when we see these applications, like, how, how do you, can you talk about how you would judge, I guess, the app, when we get the list of applications? Because I know how I pick when I judge. Oh, Jay, that's tough because um, we get such a broad variety of business ideas, business plans. Um, I would say uh, I look for the reasonableness of the underlying assumptions of the business, um, whether they're, the, the, they look like, at the end of the day, it looks like anyone has a real sense of the market, where they are in the development of a service or product. Um, is it just an idea um, or have they done any level of prototyping? Um, uh, have they got a realistic view of what it's gonna cost? what is going to, how to price their product, how to get it to market. And, and all of those are different, obviously, for, for different, um, different services, different products. We have a, a, a spectrum of expertise to each of those on the judges panel. Plus, we all have you know, additional expertise. I happen to be married to a physician. So one year we got, it's a dermatologist, one year we got three or four skin things. And I, and we've done some of the five that they were just smoking. Um, uh, so we have broad expertise. We have people who know something about medical, about medical devices, we have medical work, we have medical the IT experience. And the judges naturally defer to their perspective on things. Um, but mostly it's uh, have, have, have people done their homework in terms of understanding what that there really is a, a marketable uh, uh, 
marketable product or service that people are likely to ultimately prefer. And whether or not it is just an idea. I don't want to discourage people being early stage, but just an idea without any fleshing out probably isn't going to make it to the front. Because we want, it, it, all of us have these ideas that we think we can do. They don't go anywhere. Uh, you need to test, you need some level of reality check. Um, and the further, I'll be honest, the further along someone is, um, usually the better chances they have simply because they've got something that demonstrates they know what they're doing, they know how to get things done. It doesn't mean raising money. Um, the other thing I think I look for is that it's not just a project, that there's some level of passion. Um, it's very hard to start a business, let alone succeed. Uh, it requires tremendous commitment, and you have to really believe what you're doing to you do, your time and energy and the inevitable pain and suffering that you and anyone near you goes through. So somebody who's just doing it as an intellectual exercise is generally not very convincing that they'll see it through. We want to see people. We, we care about our success rate. So we want to be able to say, yeah, we help them we help them get to the next level. We don't want to put our money, services, income, whatever, behind something we think isn't going to make because people don't stick to it. So my mother used to call it stick to it. Um, I think the other word is persistence. We're, we're, we're looking for people who we think have persistence. Going through all that, the only thing I do is I, I get the applications, I turn on the Patriots game, and the application words and everything is more interesting than the Patriots game. That's the one I'm going for. Well, I, I would make a, it, another observation, which has changed now because we did change our format. We, we sort of, I guess, joined the, the uh, 21st century. Um, we originally, we used to have a old, old, old fashioned business plan. And I actually like those. Uh, one reason I like them uh, was that uh, they did, there were a couple of things they did. One, I'm an English lit major, and they told me that somebody could actually put three sentences together and that, that were persuasive. And the other was that um, more did not mean better. And uh, I once got a, we got a plan that was 60 pages. If you can't you know, even in the, even under the old things, you couldn't make your point in 20 to 25 pages. You didn't belong. You, you have to be able to be persuasive and direct and distill. And more is never better because it just means we have to wait for a lot of stuff that most of it. You could have condensed it, you know, and said it better. It's, it's now the issue, I think, is with the soccer deck. The opposite is a little true. People tend to not put enough in the deck, thinking that they're used to having a deck where they present. And a deck that you present is very different than a deck that is what people are going to make their initial assessment on, whether to even ask you to present. And that's how our program works. We get a very, very bare bones. Everybody fills out the same application. You make it to the seminars, you now do a deck. And you get like five minutes so you can see, to some extent, whether you've got the passion and the motivation and you can carry the next step. You really have five minutes. It's the deck we're looking at to pick the finals. And for the ultimate, there's a 30, you get 30 minutes with the judges. You can also use a deck, it can be the same one, it can be a different one. Um, for a Q&A, et cetera, where you can fill in a lot of holes. But if your deck for submission has too many holes, it, it doesn't look like you really know what you're about. And it puts into question whether you're ready. And when we, one thing we have learned, when we started this, I've been doing this now, uh, but more than anything, and um, the finance, the, the, we used to have finances, uh, real financial statements, projections in the original plan. And those were very enlightening 
uh, and just how many people, I wondered how many people couldn't balance their check. We'll see some of the financials because they just, they made no sense. Um, people assume no increase in expenses, even when they were assuming increases in sales, you know, sort of fundamental things, or they would have these absurdly low market prices when you're starting a new product. A huge amount of your dollars goes to marketing. You think you, you you think you've got the greatest reach in the world. I can't tell you as a lawyer how many times I've had a client who had better technology, a better product, but they had a competitor with an inferior product that had backing and had a huge market budget and a competitor with the price. So this thing, you know, one of the problems with the deck is that we get less information um, to make those kinds of assessments and kind of Stuff. I like the fact that it doesn't take as long to get the presentations. That's great. I just always wonder. It always came, it was like Easter week, and I have, you know, 13, 14, 20 to 30 page plans to get through it and rank. That just takes a long, but it's, uh, you don't get as much guts. So think about. If you were sitting on the other side and making a pitch, what you would want to be sure you covered, even though somebody isn't giving you a question. Thank you. I think you made the nail in the head. I think you're talking about it. I remember looking at the plans as an accountant trying to keep so posh. <laughs> but, uh, you and me. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you, you know one interesting thing is that you had five years of age. It's a really early stage. And I think what was interesting in this is the credibility of having a son is having something that's actually a pretty strong and You know, while, while the idea was, was real and you were early stage, we knew it was not just that there were legs behind it and, and that there was credibility. I think that's one of the things that if you're early stage, um, that's one of the things you look to see this for COVID. Now, counter that to Jonathan, I mean, you mentioned. I mean, would, was this a college project? I mean, how did you guys get into electrical motors? Well, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I was an engineer in college. Uh, I took inspiration from the automotive industry, kind of seeing things like Tesla coming around. And um, growing up on and around the world, my, myself and my two co founders um, looked at what was happening in the electric space, and there was really nothing happening whatsoever. Uh, so we went to a, one of our professors, asked him to do some independent research do a very basic minimum viable product for what could happen, did a very simple engine swap and found, took it to a antique book shop in Vermont actually, and people asked, can we buy it? Is this available? Is this something that's commercially available? We were at that point very much no, but then that kind of started the idea. So we then continued to do more independent research and then graduated, did a few various different business accelerators. So the Princeton one, the EU one, between Tech Open, Radar Business Bank Competition, and <coughs> there are a couple more as well. So it kind of just uh, kind of got its momentum slowly, and we did a lot of bootstrapping, but we kind of stemmed out of just seeing the antiquated industry that is the marine space and trying to try and make changes because the environmental impact, which is what it really stemmed from, is just underappreciated in every sense. The amount of pollution that goes into waters from both, both recreational boating. Was commercial kind of fishing container ships is total about three percent of global CO2 emissions. So if we can have some small impact in that, we realize that from first principles it comes down to engineering. So we can start with the smaller systems and grow that. And so we're on the pathway to electrifying the marine space and having one small drop in the ocean for reducing the CO2 emissions. Mentioned the digital light of strong. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure there was a lot of, it, it kind of started as a project, you know, a passion project. Um, but you participated in the competition, you mentioned a couple other programs you participated in. Um, how did going through that process impact where you ended up? You know, it's, it's far different from when you started, but what was the most impactful going through the processes to change where you ended up? You mentioned going to the show and somebody said, hey, can I buy this? What was that aha moment that, okay, this is a real business, this is the real the lens? So, I mean, it was always the idea because we knew that actually the problem that we were solving for ourselves, we understood that was going to be a problem we were going to 
this whole part of the world. I think the key inflection point was using these application processes as a learning uh, learning case. So we did a lot of customer interviews, and actually many of those customer interviews early on back stemming from 2015 through 2018 and 20. Um, some of them went on to be our customers, and some of them went on to be our largest investors. Uh, so kind of using each of these applications as a learning opportunity and making it useful rather than just going through the steps. Uh, so although there aren't the financial projections anymore, um, kind of the, the use cases, the different sub-markets you can go into, using that as the time, kind of put the time into the study and research kind of where the industry is, where it has been in the past, and then using that information to project out where you think it's going to be in the future. So I think there was no kind of one individual point that made it a realization that it could be tangible, because at the end of the day, the worst case scenario is that we build ourselves a metric boat, and this, which that's obviously not what we were shooting for. Uh, we were shooting to revolutionize the marine industry, uh, but it's got to happen one step at a time. So uh, it's more kind of a horizon that we're realizing it possible. Now, before it was small inshore watercraft, uh, and now it's yacht, yacht cruises with their tenders, uh, large hull manufacturers are now partnering with us to offer an electric solution. Um, so kind of the breadth and depth of the horizon that that should continue to expand. Um, and that's something that at the end of the day would learn about the opportunity. So there was no one in particular point, it's just learning where uh, where our product is being sold. Thanks, it's an Secretary on the phone, or Super Secretary of Commerce, but the Commerce, Commerce is her position now. She lives in the end of the day. Is that where we work for? Can I ask a question? Because uh, I think it's relevant. It goes to the credibility question, which is, uh, did you, my recollection is you did, but I didn't read it yet. Um, in terms of accessing expertise, advisors, et cetera, both in the from the technology, marketing, um, potential capital raise. Did you, I mean, could you talk a little bit about that? Because a lot of times we, we see a, 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 a small, pretty inexperienced um, uh, applicant, but they are often backed by um, people who have experience that, it, you know, there's really a message there. I mean, they think they're worth their time and energy. That, it gives them more, more weight. Absolutely. I mean, mentors are one of the most powerful assets that companies can have. Uh, one of our most important mentors and advisors now on our advisory board, um, he was my undergraduate thesis advisor in college. He continued just helping out, and now he's actually moved to Columbia, and we now partner with the Columbia Electro Chemical Energy Center. So we work alongside universities now. So, absolutely. I mean, mentors are the most powerful thing just to review. We didn't necessarily use them to review our pitch material um, for this application. Uh, when we went down, we went a little bit further down the line for pitching potential investors. That was definitely an opportunity that we kind of did a try run in front of them. And the experience that they had actually, we never found a more difficult question than from our advisors, which actually is the most you can ask for from your advisors. Um, so it's definitely the optimal solution to learn from other people's mistakes rather than going through that steps yourselves because. When you're a startup and money is short, um, mistakes are expensive. Um, and particularly in a hardware space, we've made a couple of mistakes where um, it's been hit and misses the whether it's going to allow us to continue. Uh, and that's why kind of events like the Rhode Island Business Bank competition allowed us to actually get that functional prototype, uh, which got all sparkled out on a boat uh, out in the Narragansett Bay in pretty cold weather. Um, and it's uh, that's the most persuasive. Uh, Persuasive tool that you can have is kind of functional prototypes to, to show that there's some legitimacy behind it, reverse on the final product. Uh, I'm emphasizing that this is the MVP of what it could be. Uh, goes to the critical point. I would agree you wanted to see it from the light server on or is it the best? Because there's a couple of levels behind yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I think it's a few, it's, it's just a few shot months ago. Stage and you, and you said this was a new idea. Um, yours was a little different because it was a different cooperative. And you know, so Ron had been tapped into this impossible alternative company and said, Hey, we've got businesses, but this one thing we're all lacking. It was kind of like, I guess, a financial just an aha moment where you're like, Yeah, okay, this is, this is a business. Um, talk about how that came to be. Right? Did you jump in there? When did you decide this is, this is something that isn't just. 
for autistic students. Um, so, you know, I've, I've had some affiliation with COVID since 2016. Um, and so I, so my, I used to work for a European based company and I needed somewhere in the US to work. And, um, so that's how I started, got involved in COVID in the first place. Then through my involvement and relationship with them, they were like, can you help out so and so and can you direct somebody into this? And so I was just kind of always assisting a little bit. And then through that, that's kind of how I made connections with all these other companies that had some affiliation with the company. So Protest started off in LA, Project Pasta. Um, so originally Suna Bloom actually came from the originally for the purpose of co-packing. Um, and so there was kind of this moment where we were all kind of talking about the pain points and what we were going through. Um, there were some other companies that I also assisted with also brought out on the way. And we were like, the one thing we really need is we all want a place to make our make our product, make it safely, but collaboratively. And that's when the word Plantopia literally started as a joke. And we're like, well, just it'll be like Utopia, like Plantopia. And then it kind of had a ring to it and it spun on the same thing. And we realized, you know, we need space to make the products, but we also need some support. We need, you know, I was providing some patient support and some help. So there was kind of a joint set of plans. So then it got into space need. How do we get in front of somebody that can help, help us find space, help us find equipment, help us find introduce, and maybe help us find other also in the same boat because sharing costs, sharing issues, how can we make this all come together? So we had started actually reaching out to commerce. Um, that was you know where we started off doing the exact reaching out to commerce, trying to explain like open main is awesome, it's great, but then there is a big gap between open main and the next stage. And how can we work through estimates and how can we maybe get in touch with other companies? And I think what's been really interesting is some of the stuff that's already been in the works, a little bit like the branch movement that's been happening downstairs, a little bit of some are kind of helping alleviate some of the gap that we were dealing with, and then that helps us so many more other companies that we really need. So coming out of this, um, some of the consulting uh, being here on the work I was already doing, I was able to funnel that into focusing on the industry and saying, actually, this idea or this is a part that really has legs, this is a part that really makes sense, and this is kind of sort of the services part of it that we can really zone in and have some current reality. And then um, since there's been some new development, development of the co space that we're partnered with that would be kind of like the other side of things. So it's really been a good way of saying this is our common needs. Here's where some of these things can be communicated and this is these are the things that we're looking for. So I understand what co pack is because they share exactly how they work with those things. Co-packing, so there's kind of two words that get thrown around a lot, co-packing and co-manufacturing. And so co-manufacturing co is technically more appropriate because that's actually manufacturing of food. Co-packing is that it's just really good product in the packaging. Um, so what will happen, generally speaking, is you have these food startups or companies that come up with an idea, and then they go, okay, well, we're, we can't make it manually by hand or artisanal anymore. We need to make it at scale to make profit. And generally speaking, we do not have the facilities to do that, so we make this company that does the parting Rhode Island to be able what, to meet the margins to really be successful. Then, because you know, as a bit as when any company is starting up, the amount of money that has to go into your marketing and all those other costs. But then, if you are physically hand making all of the products, you're never going to usually make a cost of the product. So, um, so co-manufacturers generally are facilities that you pay them a tolling fee and they manufacture manufacture your product for you. You submit your formulations to them and they're at that location they will make the formulation to your specifications. One of the big major problems, especially in the plant-based food movement, is that a lot of these facilities are shared use. So there's eggs, there's milk, there might be fish. So it's both an allergen concern or from a safety standpoint, um, and it's also you're trying to keep sure that it's plant-based, so that's another major concern. And that was actually one of the issues even with the point is that a lot of cross-contamination was happening during one food for the kitchen, but other issues. And so if you can play it now, there's various testing methodologies and things you can do to come and verify that. But when you're at a co-packer, you can never never be a hundred percent sure that they're gonna be there because you can't be there every day. You're you're not the person to do it. And now one of the what was actually interesting is um there's a fairly famous Rhode situation where a different type of product, not food, was unfortunately being made at a co-packer and the co-packer changed the formulation. And that actually, this isn't the first time I've heard of this site. There was actually a co-manufacturer in, um, co in Maine that was making a product for a client of mine. And they uh, 
wasting ten thousand dollars for a chance to get our nutrition by right about destroyed because they were not following the formula. And this was really important because they actually had a uh, process authority letter that they had to be following the organization guidelines. And so by changing the formulation to violate the process authority letter, which was the first time they did. Um, so <laughs> lots the of company can get destroyed and all the reputational risk, right. and it's not because even anything. Yeah. Right. And sometimes, unfortunately, you have some co manufacturers that are owned by huge venture capital firms. Um, so I used to work for a co manufacturer that got bought off a venture capital firm a year ago. Um, and some of them are little family owned businesses. So there's a huge range there. Um, and sometimes there's also a huge issue where a co manufacturer that was located in Brockton um, eventually went under. But because um, they decided to take the legal seafoods chowder recipe and start selling it as their own. Um, so if you can think about it now, legal seafoods obviously have the legal power to fight that. But if you're a small entrepreneur, if you've developed this great formula, and if you go to a co-packer and you're trusting them, and then they rip you off and they go start selling it, you don't necessarily maybe have all the legal expertise to go fight them. And things like that can happen. So there's a lot of complicated layers to this. So one of the things you know we all had really encountered was this food safety, the allergen control, um, ownership of the IP. So that was a big thing that we were really trying to go after. And then Keeping the businesses in Rhode So that's where the whole I switched in. And one of the things for me is I think it's really sad to see businesses start here, see with all this creativity and then see people depart. Um, and that also means that all that revenue and all that money and local ingredients aren't necessarily being used. So being able to have co and then from the standpoint of the ownership being able to physically drive to your own factor when they happen. It's like right now I have to get on the plane to go find my factor when she happens. Um, so those were all of the big factors that were so many odds there. Well, I actually will go to the street. I was actually cutting this with my hand saw when I was 16 years old. And, you know, the one thing that you know that works inside the food industry understands is that not only do you have all these issues, the other issue on the back end is that our know, product is going to shelf life. You don't sell it in that, that period of time. Um, all that work that went into the costs goes in the trash, whereas you know, with the plus marine business, you can manufacture and put it on a shelf and maybe tweak it later on. It's not necessarily a shelf life, but, you know, there's an evolution in that industry. And how do you stay, I guess, how do you stay ahead of the evolution in the industry? Because eventually, you mentioned, and I bring this up because you mentioned, there's always somebody with, with bigger pockets than you. And so you come up with this electrical wood motor. Eventually, there's going to be the big competitors that you can kind of um, rub the wrong way, if you will, because you're taking market share from them and you're getting all the buzz. So, how do you stay ahead of that? How do you stay ahead of that? Yeah, so I mean, the industry as a whole is, as I mentioned before, incredibly antiquated. So, the vast majority of the combustion driven engines, so there are a handful of large conglomerates that own the majority of the entire industry. So actually, they're not motivated to develop electric systems because they're going to then be capitalizing that load sales. So we listen to their quarterly investment updates. They're always on the trade companies. So we just look through their financial reports, see where they're spending money, see who their new recent hires are to develop an electric propulsion division. We've spoken with a lot of their executives, and they've said they're looking to grow the electric space through strategic acquisitions, which is an industry standard in many cases. Uh, that's one thing to rely on, but then at the other end of the spectrum, it's to actually just be fast with our development, um, take a ground up design approach, which is difficult. A lot of what our competition does is take an old combustion arm, combustion motor, repurpose the power head, and then sell that system. There are inherent inefficiencies resulting from that, both weight um, and propulsive efficiency. So we took the approach of totally just ground up design. So we designed every system around electric propulsion. Uh, to improve reliability, robustness, um, efficiency, and that's allowed us to get a product out there that actually serves as a direct drop in replacement for combustion motors. Uh, but up to this point, no one else has been able to do that. So that's the main way that we're staying ahead of competition, which is growing quickly and developing our tech as we learn. I don't think I've seen businesses get acquired and get put on the shelf so that it doesn't disrupt that industry because it's. Happens a long time and might you Absolutely. And I, I mean, our goal is to just create the kill product that serves, uh, serves the needs for a lot of our customers. So, 
whether our exit strategy is sort of just continuing to grow the public, uh, get acquired, um, stay private. We're not in it for one particular exit strategy. Our goal is to get a huge number of sales and have great customer feedback and then increase the growth organically. So um, the final exit strategy is not a huge concern for us. It's obviously something that we have to think through for when our investors say it, what's the exit strategy. Um, but actually, when that's the answer, they're generally less concerned in sort of getting to um, funds which have certain payback periods. Um, but we get a little bit more specific answers. But um, yeah, our goal is just to sell a lot of motors and make motors happy and uh, take all the pain points out of the out of boating uh, and also try and reduce the total fuel emissions that uh, they're reporting. I can ask what the uh, greatest challenge. I guess the question that I would raise is if you had, I can't say a million dollar check, I've got a billion dollar check. Um, because, because in theory, you spend half the time fundraising. I don't think people realize that that's, that's far from it. doesn't seem to make a great mission in the operations. But, so if you had a billion dollar check, what would you do? Um, so, I mean, right now, I, I would say that our goal is to get acquired. Um, but at the same point, I think there's also been some partners who have identified that definitely equivalent to the capacity factor. I think that's one of the things that people talk about a lot is managing equipment functionality and like how much to invest in and things of that nature. Um, and then, you know, uh, resources. So I think one of the things we were talking to is obviously a different business. How many people can hire, can you keep on, you know, what's a day of six salaries you're going to get? I think those are all. Um, that can then take some of the you know, day to day frustrations out of it. Um, and I think what I would say is that there's also kind of evolving. Like you mentioned about like shelf life, you know, and things like that, and like the evolution of the industry. So looking at the plant based food industry and seeing where it's going and seeing where some of the partners are going, and that can really change like, what kind of equipment you want to invest in. Um, some things like saying, okay, yeah, shelf life extension, but we are different mechanisms that we want to invest in because we're going to want to have products that like a six month to four month shelf life, this is what we want to invest in. Um, somebody that has that billion dollars and the investment in you. Because you know it's going to be second fund, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think one of the biggest things, and this is where I think one of our big learnings coming out of this was kind of the sort of slow your roll till you're ready kind of thing. So saying, okay, these are the parts of the business that we need to go and keep working on, these are the parts that we need to flesh out and go after more. Um, so I think part of it is really having that mapped out. So you not only have the passion, but you know what it takes. So some things we've been really focusing on is you know, laying out saying, here's how we did the financial plan to try to grow the team for this current time period, and here's what the projections can look like. Um, and factoring in like this is what we can do. Um, one of the things we were presented with was an opportunity where we could have signed a lease for space. We were in the process of renegotiating that lease because their initial lease looked Good, but there was like there is a massive amount of financial risk here. And so we were saying, let's take a pause, let's look at it, let's renegotiate. Well, we're going to renegotiate the lease. Someone else put that space in. Um, they later needed to have a go find it and get to break even. So let's say this was pretty expensive. So I think being able to kind of uh, slow your roll, get where you need to be, lay everything out, and show this is past history, build confidence, build the credibility, getting all that set up. I think those are some of the John, uh, your team has been successful in raising funds. Um, what's been the hardest part in that process? Um, in the fundraising, I would like to maybe push back a little bit in terms of kind of one of the most challenging things is actually finding some great talent to join your team. Um, as we continue to grow, we grew from a team of three. We're now pushing 30, and our goal is to 50 uh, in the next few months. So just relying on networks is a great asset to have. Um, at some point, they're going to get a little bit dry, just in terms of the number of esoteric skilled engineers that I know um, is limited. So actually building out that base, we now work with we work with universities to actually get a talent pipeline. So we work with Brown uh, for those local students. So we get a lot of Brown interns, which we then bump them straight into full-time employees once we've had a low-risk uh, few months internship with them. Um, on the fundraising, the most challenging part 
falls, I'd say at the start was, it was a little bit difficult because as soon as COVID hit, everyone's response was, it's not you, I just want to reassess the situation and make sure that my current investments are stable. So that's a difficult situation to be in. So then after we kind of continue to um, look around at different family offices, then you start looking at kind of different financial instruments. So whether you go um, straight into venture capital, you do fundraising, uh, you do things like uh, crowdfunding, which makes sense for different use cases, but it's difficult. It's important to make sure that it works for you um, because actually it might seem great that you spoke to a few, um, a few companies that you do crowdfunding, and actually it seems great on the surface level, but once you get into details on the long term cost of that relationship, um, it's not quite the return that you hoped for. So I would say the most challenging thing for us was just getting that first meeting, um, just because people were terrified of COVID. Um, having being over over a Zoom conversation, you just can't express the passion. It doesn't come, quite come through in the way that it does uh, when they can see you're a little bit nervous. They can see you kind of making sure you know your lines, you know your pitch, uh, because that's one way that these investors kind of know that you're fully involved and invested in it. So once we got those first few meetings, it was it's still by all means took its time, um, but I would say those that was the most challenging thing was getting the first. A lot of interesting things that I don't know about. Um, yes, on crowdfund, there's a bright email course for it. Like if I look at cap tables, those are companies that have done fundraising and always end up coming to the right when they go and try to raise more money. It's interesting. So it was a hassle because the, the sophisticated investors don't want the crowdfund investors in and they don't want to give up. So, um, but you, you hit on something that was really interesting too. You know, I'm not even sharing all I'm thinking. I, it used to be to raise funds as a startup, there was the angel or the VC row that you went. Um, but there is a third row that has popped up the last couple of years that's becoming much more player than standard mortgage. And, and what that is, is, you know, there's a lot of um, wealthy families that have, oh, and they, they basically set up a company. It's, it's sophisticated knowledgeable investors, instead of bringing money in the stock market, they're now looking at startups and private companies. And it's just, it's funny, I just realized every day say, you know, it's a startup, you know, yeah, you know, I met with the family office and usually there's also the, the passion, if it's something you're passionate with, they'll write a check and just, and, and, and the, hardest, the hardest thing you used to be just doing the fundraising. You hit on the second hardest thing now too, is the talent shortage, which um, it used to be when you started a company, you would go networking because you needed to find where you're going to connect funds from. But now you also have to network because you have to find out where you're going to build your team from because there's less and less people. And to go and pay a recruiting firm to find your talent, you're looking at 35 to 50% of first year salary to earn your cash burn rate really quick. Um, so they want to highlight that because those are all really, that's really good information. So let's talk about the network. How do you? Obviously, you said you work in the department, but you're out of school now. How, how do you build your, your network? What are you just doing to build a network? Get that talent pipeline um, besides all these universities. I know around, you said you guys went from all these like 30 year old now. Yeah, I mean, it took a couple of years. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you just kind of had some kind of flavor to those two versus relationships. So uh, I'm also an entrepreneur resident at, uh, actually at UMass Boston now, but I'm going to be working at Brown. Um, so I work with kind of the director of engineering. There, uh, there's a prime program which is an entrepreneurship and engineering program. So we work directly with them. So we give you kind of tours to their students. Uh, we work with, I work with some faculty to kind of help them take ideas that are in their labs because a lot of these professors, although they're um, old and gray, they still kind of want, often want to see their work come to market. And although they're incredibly smart, they have multiple PhDs. That's something that they may not have experience with. So if we kind of help them, they then have postdocs. They have undergraduates, graduate students, uh, which they're then emotionally invested in what we're doing, uh, and they would then recommend um, us to them. So we continue, it's important for us to get a strong and continuous pipeline of talent, uh, because we want to continue to grow. Um, in terms of other areas, there's also kind of outreach. Uh, being an engineering firm, um, diversity is pretty difficult. Uh, and actually, so kind of on the recruiting firm, so we use, we had to resort to, uh, we're using 
losing some recruitment firms. Um, I think if they're charging you 30% then I need to find a better one. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean those are we found that they, they are useful, uh, but they are again very expensive. Um, but yeah, I mean it's always kind of just keeping an eye out for um, all potential talent, kind of letting your network know that actually so we offer um, an incentive. So if someone reaches out to me and says, puts their friend in contact with me, I'll give a thousand dollars because actually that's a whole lot cheaper than any recruiter. Uh, and that suddenly means that kind of the thousand people who I might actually have a conversation with, uh, that then suddenly is an order of magnitude larger. Um, so we do that for our employees as well. So if our employee, any of our employees have a friend who they uh, introduce to the company and we go and hire them, we'll give them, a, um, give them some cash because um, that's what a lot of people are motivated by. Uh, but it does also mean that they're kind of passionate and kind of come to events like this. Uh, we chat their networks and we keep them meeting there. Um, so long as we're making Luxembourg in a great place to work, uh, that shines through because people just, we, uh, we're not the sort of place that clocks you in, clocks you out, or sees how long you're waiting for, and that's how we grade, and that's how we give kind of our reports. Uh, it's very much productivity based, so we give people the opportunity to kind of be their own leaders, take, take control of their situations, which we found is quite a rarity. Uh, so when a lot of our employees are coming from larger defense contractors, uh, they're kind of just boxed in in red tape. Uh, so kind of letting them spread their wings a little bit. They love that. Uh, they kind of feel like they have a lot more freedom. They feel like they can kind of learn, which um, as a leader, that's what we need to make sure that all our boys feel like they're continuing to grow and learn uh, because they just share that and then people are like, I want to work with someone like that. And that's how we found a good number of our more recent employees. Uh, but I mean, it's by no means easy to continue uh, to find this mix of talented engineers and I'm just going to ask you um, the types of um, positions that I mean, tech, you know, what the backgrounds of people, because you know, there is a, sort of a uh, as the company evolves in terms of product and marketing, the, the needs, the, the, the personnel needs probably change. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you, they're kind of growing pains effectively, and then you're trying to. Have to hire and bring the procedures and processes uh, that aren't just central core to your technology stack. So after, after our first fundraise, we hired a software engineer and a patent engineer um, because those actually filled the roles that we needed to fill. Uh, some of the knowledge gaps we needed to kind of grow as well. Um, after our zero day funding round, then we hired more engineers, but we stepped away from just the engineering roles and we just hired a director of talent. So she did just incredible. And it means that actually, after our first funding round, I was the one who was screening resumes, doing first round interviews, which I can do, but it's not really what I want to be doing. Uh, so, having kind of someone who actually enjoys doing it, brings value to that, has, has been done, done it before in companies much larger than we are, was a great asset to have on board. So, now with still majority engineers of different types, uh, but now we kind of have um, a few business development analysts and then. Uh, Who's doing the manufacturing? Uh, so it's a combination of in house and uh, contract manufacturers. So we predominantly see ourselves as assembler, final assemblers, just to get that quality control checks in house. Uh, as we continue to grow, we're going to bring in more of that manufacturing in house. So we have prototyping facilities on site such that we can do fast iterations so that we can make a one off, iterate it, design it, improve it, and then send it out to the uh, batch manufacturer because we just don't have the economies of scale yet. Um, that some a job shop, uh, either local or overseas, has that um, would like to get eventually, but um, that's not what our, where our real house is. Ours is kind of designing, um, designing the product, marketing the product, and selling the product. Uh, the actual kind of raw manufacturing is better suited to a foundry. Um, you know, but again, down the line, that kind of, if you had a billion dollars, probably build up a foundry, build a manufacturing space in the Midwest. Um, it's so, a building, I think, down in South County. <laughs> we actually, so we just moved into down to Bristol. Uh, our original office was on yeah, Prime Marina over in East Greenwich. So we were working out of the boat bay. Uh, they shrink wrapped the walls of, because there were no walls in the boat bay. Um, they converted it upstairs, so we had about 2,000 square feet in total. Um, and so we were working out of there for about a year and a half, and then we just moved into um, a new space in Bristol, which is about 45,000 square feet. Uh, we're building the offices of a number between 50 and 100 desk employees, uh, and then a manufacturing floor as well, which will be a lot to, uh, a lot to learn. So we're dealing with kind of contract 
actors, it's everything, uh, but it's been a great experience, and I think it's, uh, it's all going in the right direction, which is uh, all we can ask for, but we always want it to be a concert. It's, it gets small pretty quickly. As soon as we now have kind of a couple of dozen just folks in there for uh, potential customers, and you walk in, it's just cavernous. And then once you put in a, like a sort of not there, the office is going to be suddenly you're actually having to walk around. Before we just, when we first moved in there, I would drive from one corner to the other. Because, yeah, uh, now it's, uh, but now we now have direct talent who puts in the walls and all that drive. So, <laughs> But liability there, I mean, she's great for that, but uh, a lot of our engineers have to skateboard around and I get, I feel like a new parent at this point, because if, if someone falls off, I feel responsible and they're kind of you're dipping under these um, um, racks and things like that. So I don't want to be like ooh, skateboarding, but at the same time, you want to know everyone to enjoy it, so it's a, a balance. Well, there's a lot of roles. You're ready for your OSHA visit. Oh, yeah, we, that's, so we're preparing for that, so kind of learning all OSHA regulations, so uh, I have to. I had to learn to be a forklift instructor in the space of an hour and a half, uh, having never actually been a forklift before. But now, by OSHA regulations, I'm qualified to teach people how to drive a forklift truck. Uh, a little concerning, but um, no mistakes, that's all good. Our space, I mean, after you use right now, maybe we just put a kitchen in there, maybe we could clean up some coat packing, things like that. Um, let's talk about what we're at. Last thing we want to talk about is triple system around. Um, I also had some great things going on with entrepreneurship. Um, do you have anything? You mentioned the lease. Do you have some calculations as a term condition? You're probably going to be short at this point. But um, what services or what opportunities in Brian um, have you seen, used, or know that are available to entrepreneurs that are really valuable besides? Um, so I think one of the things that was good about you know, a good thing about this competition is that did Rhode Island have always said it's like you gotta know a guy that knows things find out stuff. Um, and it did kind of open some more doors and make us more connections. So I'd say, you know, some of this is related to funding um, and raising capital. So I'd say that there are more connections we made, you know, through the competition and as a result of the competition and stuff that I've never made with them. So I think that's been a really promising part. Um, so I'm also some leads on some leads on real estate space, some more things. Because they, one thing we're doing is we know it's a very competitive real estate market right now. So as spaces kind of come up, or there's spaces that like don't even hit the market, but somebody knows they might be available, we gotta find out that it's just the right point. So I think you know making more connections from that standpoint as an entrepreneur, I think that's just we're really busy doing lots of other things. So trying to get a lead on some of these things and get in there and see the space um, and get the connections, I think is part of it. Um, a lot of commercial owners get to know not a lot of commercial owners get to know. Not a lot, right. And so one thing we ran into a lot was trying to explain to people what, for example, the space needs to really have to be. Um, so you talk about OSHA regulations, and I tried to explain to people about like, well, food manufacturing, like you have to think about non-slip, like actually all those beautiful mill buildings, great, but really not good for me. So there's a lot of things about trying to talk to people about, you know, like, yeah, you think your, this space is fantastic, however, this is only like, um, I would describe to people like sometimes I'm actually looking for stuff like that like because what actually looks great for my needs, like I don't need like a big corner space that has a short run, but I do need it to fit all these other boxes. Um, so that was a you know a big part of trying to make those connections and things like that. I do think that um, just be able to, you know, I, I think we're out to see such a rare place now. Maybe I've lived here for over a decade and I'm still learning about it. So I say since this competition I've learned some more and I think that's what and I think, you know, as a result of some of the connections we've made, it, a lot of it hasn't been direct. It's been like a little bit of six degrees of separation, but we're eventually getting there. We're eventually, people that I've been trying to talk to for a couple of years, now I'm finally able to talk to, we're seeing, you know, kind of pass forward. Yeah, it's interesting. The six degrees of separation. Six degrees of um, John, how about your team? What has... What services or benefits as a Rhode Island offer to, to your team that's kept you here? Yeah, so there are a couple of highlights. So the uh, Department of Commerce um, has an innovation voucher program. So that allows you to work, they can do grants and work with what they call a knowledge provider, which is often a university or university or academic institution. So that was what pulled us initially was when our publication space in Boston shut down because of COVID. Um, we got a grant to work with Iris, the operation school down in Newport, they were totally shut down.
account, and they were actually um, they were thankful for that contract. They allowed us to work out of their manufacturing space, which then allowed us to actually complete the prototype, um, which just in some ways got us the success of the funding round. Um, so the, those innovations are actually great. We're continuing to do more of them now, just because it's the first phase of our digital capital grant, which you can apply for anything up to fifty thousand dollars of forty nine 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 nine. Um, and they're great. Um, they kind of put you in contact with different people. There's a uh, few different institutions they've worked with, um, and all the people there are just wonderful. Uh, there's also the the state as well as a whole. Being such a small state, they're very accommodating to kind of new businesses that are uh, coming up, up and coming. So we recently got a couple million dollars in tax credits for new employees. So that's an incentive for such for the the next I think eight employees we get to get tax, some tax write-offs, which Helps hugely because although we were successful in uh, a Series A funding round, cash is still incredibly short. Uh, it seems like a lot when it first kind of hits your bank account, uh, but then you realize how many things you're pulling out of it, and it's just a slow drip feed down or quite a fast drip feed down. Um, so having this one state uh, and these various different kind of companies and institutions in general is a great asset. Um, and yeah, I mean, we were looking, considering we were originally in Massachusetts. We are considering Connecticut, they have similar programs. Uh, we're looking at Rhode Island, uh, but at the end of the day, we actually have an updated confirmation that we can get these credits. Uh, we chose to stay here, and it was a decision we never regret. I would also second the innovation doctors. So, several of the mentors we have never worked with us were second to the innovation doctors, and I also helped um, the technology provider assist some people with them. Um, it is you know, kind of an interesting process to navigate because one gets to talk to people about, like, actually, this is probably going to Probably going to install out if you don't do this, this, and this. This is probably what they want to see. I think it, that's been an interesting process to navigate. But definitely also a great way to talk about um, Final thoughts that you'd like to share with uh, potential entrepreneurs as to positives, negatives, uh, to starting a business or going through the process? I mean, it's going to be rewarding. Uh, so generally goes in our direction. Uh, or at least in hindsight, uh, there are a lot of kind of challenges, but they always kind of give context and kind of the upsides. Um, so I would say it's, yeah, I love the ability to kind of actually pick uh, and do the things that I think are best for the company. Uh, by that same token, that pressure. Um, there are hundreds of things that I could be doing, which I could argue are pretty reasonable things to be doing on a Friday afternoon. Uh, however, there's only one thing that's a much better thing to be doing. Uh, and that's the case to, 24 uh, 7, weekends, nights, evenings. Um, and so, kind of actually being strict for yourself of knowing kind of what the most productive thing to be doing. Um, sometimes you only know hindsight. Uh, and actually, after you've been working on something for three hours, like, oh, so it's something I shouldn't be doing. Uh, but actually, using that as a lesson, uh, finding kind of the silver lining in that also, although yes, you may have wasted a couple of hours, uh, actually, it's given you better tools to kind of direct how you can make them forward um, in the future. So. I mean, you can kind of take, again, a silver lining from that is that I found that I, every day I'm learning something new, uh, which is what I look for in a job. And there's a lot of companies that I might consider working for. Um, that was not an option. Uh, and when I speak with my friends who are in kind of some of these companies, uh, that lack of freedom um, is something that they uh, envy and are comfortable with. Um, so that's kind of definitely on the upside, but the downside is definitely that um, there's no five o'clock. Office, uh, which again, if you have passionate, and which you kind of should be if you're doing a startup, if you're not passionate about it, uh, you're on the wrong field. Um, so kind of there's no off switch, which um, can be a challenge sometimes. But um, yeah, so that's what I'm to say. So I agree. I think I could never work for that freedom. But the downside is um, often when our mom sells cars, we're driving there. And you're responsible for making sure the business runs well, and those cars are driving to different places. Jobs. So it is, there's, there's a lot of bosses, there's a lot of risks, but you're right, you have to have the passion. You're actually seeing that kind of come through. Um, so it can, when I kind of hear our employees talk about the ways, so we've now started kind of doing some enormous feedback surveys as part of our um, effort to improve company culture as a whole, which is going to get, because um, often we find that I have an impression of what my employees think, but actually that might not necessarily be true. Uh, so giving them that outlook to kind of voice their feelings 
um, and then hearing the ownership that they have about kind of fostering this environment um, is something that actually hit me a little bit more than I thought it would. Uh, in that I actually didn't know these people six months ago, nine months ago, uh, and now they're speaking pretty eloquently about how much they want being where they are, how meaningful it is, and how much they kind of wish they had found this place and this job earlier on in their career. Uh, and hearing that kind of just um, goes a couple of things. Uh, yeah, so I actually had, um, so because I'm a little bit curious, I'm an entrepreneur, but I also associate have a full time job too. And one of the things that my CEO, who actually was in the eighth company, as an entrepreneur, so he's a serial entrepreneur, but the point is he's a lot more money than I am. Um, he, uh, one thing, you know, one time I said, well, I don't want to do this because it's, it's, it might be a waste of my time. I don't want to waste my time. And he's like, I have all sorts of things all the time that happen to me, happen to waste my time. And if there's going to be, you know, it's kind of, it's something that sticks out in my head because he's somebody who's, you know, I think his time is he very valuable. And I'm like, I don't want to waste my time on spreadsheet, but I think it's stupid. Um, but he's like, well, you suss it out, see if it makes sense. Yeah, it may or may not waste your time, but maybe you think it's good exercise. And I think if somebody at his level, you know, kind of says that, that his time gets wasted occasionally, but that's red reality. And kind of looking back, there's lots of red herrings, lots of things come up, you know, lots of people go, oh yeah, I'll do that thing, or I want to how do you come in on this, or what do you think about this? And sometimes they turn out to be the right direction, sometimes they don't. And you kind of have to like be able to like be prepared for all of that. And I think that's a big thing is that, you know, some people might say like, oh yeah, I want to invest in you, I can got money in the buy. Or we literally had somebody cancel um, a, a pitch deck meeting, like I think 20 minutes before, before the meeting. We were literally like getting, like, we spent all, like, all day prepping for it, and then it got canceled, and we were like, you spent like a whole weekend, and then there's a passion. Like your weekends are going to get taken up by you know trying to work through things and trying to understand stuff. And if you don't have the passion, you're going to feel burnt out really fast. And you have to really care about what you're doing, um, and you have to like be on board. And I think that you know sort of like there's some things at the top that make it hard, so to speak. You know, if you want the the nine to five or the job security, and there's no, it's like there are positions and places and things for that. You know, working in the food industry, I guess it's plain like. Um, you know, I, I used to work for the second largest food company in the world. And that was a pretty, pretty secure, pretty quality kind of position. There was, you know, you didn't get a lot of ownership. You didn't get a lot of say. Um, and that actually became a company problem. That one time they actually said, act like an owner. And that's the business objectives company wide. So I read Rosenfeld and really told everyone, act like an owner. Um, then I was once told after meeting, maybe you act a little too much like an owner. <laughs> so I think, you know, putting yourself in a position to be like, all right, this wasn't what I wanted to do. This is my passion I bring to the table. I want to do this, but you have to be able to prepare for everything else that's going to come on the other side. Um, you know, getting into like the finance business side of it is a guy, you know, it's even sitting down and talking to some of my colleagues and saying, hey, like if we do this massive financial thing, this is all the risk we are taking on for this business. Um, you know, just the big reality checks in the back of my head. Well, just finally. Check our website. Our next event is on October 13th. It's a, a workshop called Perfecting Your Pitch because right after that event on November 10th, we will be having our annual pitch contest with prizes of in excess of a thousand dollars. Um, so I thank everybody for the time and attention, and we'll see you at our next event. Thank you. Yeah, the uh, community hall complex. Yeah. So we've got a brewery, distillery, yeah. and